answers. Uh, I'm going to concentrate maybe on the last 10. But before we get to the modern era, I'd like to go way back. Uh, and concrete on the West Coast, the first building built, uh, a concrete building west of the Mississippi, was the top picture. And I don't know if you recognize that, but that's the Stanford Museum. Uh, Jane Stanford desperately wanted to have the building built uh, when Stanford was to open in 1896 or 1897. And so someone uh, uh, told her, well, there's this new technology uh, called concrete, and it's expensive, but, but we can build much faster than, say, with brick or stone. And Ernest Ransom was the engineer, and uh, uh, they built this portion of the museum in time for the opening of Stanford. And then subsequently, they, they filled in all around the museum with like a two-story massive complex of unreinforced brick masonry, which is cheap, was cheap at the time. And, and then in 1906, uh, all of that collapsed. All of the brick masonry was just a mess. And, but the museum did pretty well, okay? And so they, they fixed it up and, uh, and basically put plaster in all the cracks that occurred. And then in, uh, in Loma Prieta, um, the building was damaged again and closed. And I happened to, uh, at the time I was, uh, after Loma Prieta, I was a consultant to Stanford. So I had to babysit this building uh, while it, we were figuring out what to do with it. And we noticed that, there, that it had broken up into the same blocks that uh, had occurred in 1906. And so, uh, we, uh, Degen Kolb uh, and, and, and I worked together and we, we, we decided to put a ring, essentially put a ring around the blocks and let them rock. And uh, so, so this was, uh, you know, like I say, one of the first buildings uh, built. Uh, then after that, if we look at the history, I call this the, the, this the WPA era, where there were a lot of short, two, three-story concrete bearing wall buildings built. Um, and uh, uh, th this picture, this second picture is, is a, uh, at the Clark Kerr campus at Berkeley. And these buildings, uh, there's a lot of them around. They, they tend to be uh, short, stocky buildings and generally have done very well in past earthquakes. But uh, architects and designers finally figured out that concrete would take on any form that you wanted to have if you just built a form and poured concrete in it. And so they began to make columns smaller, they used pre-stressing came into to play and all that. And these were all great uh, uh, innovations in themselves, but they weren't uh, really ready for prime time when it comes to earthquakes. And that was, of course, made abundantly clear in 1971. The, the two last pictures are uh, the uh, psychiatric center at Ollie View before and after the earthquake. So what happened? Well, I think we, uh, most of us, uh, a few young people in here, but uh, the, there were some major changes in the building code as a result, 1973 and 1976. They had vastly improved details of construction. Um, they, you know, we consider irregularities directly. And essentially we have pretty high uh, confidence in, um, in reinforced concrete structure, uh, construction after this period and certainly today. Um, it's interesting though it, that the, the principles of ductile concrete uh, were, were developed uh, at least 10 years earlier. Uh, there was a great book, if you ever could take a look at it, by Newmark, Bloom, and Corning uh, that essentially sets the stage for ductile concrete. And, and, but it took, it took San Fernando uh, to get it into our building codes. So everything's okay, right? Uh, not quite. Uh, there's a big difference, as we all know, between what you see before and after uh, 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 19 the mid 1970s when it comes to concrete construction. Um, so I can remember actually a, a time I, I was I was that was 40 years ago, uh, 
uh, and I was a very young engineer, and 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 somehow I, uh, I got to serve on a committee with uh, uh, the chair was Henry Dagenkolb, and there was a bunch of other big names, and I just sort of hung out and took notes, you know, and and I can remember a meeting, and this is this is true. Everyone used to accuse. Uh, structural engineers of making decisions about codes in a room filled with cigar smoke and over bourbon. And <laughs> one time I can remember sitting there uh, smelling Henry Dinkold's cigar and, with a glass of bourbon and Henry saying, what are we going to do about all the buildings that are out there that, that, that uh, we, we were on a committee to update the San Francisco building code and, and, it, and they got it into the San Francisco code and, and we were all happy, but Henry said, what are we gonna do about all the other ones that are out there? So, uh, what, what, uh, what we know as engineers, okay, uh, and many others uh, that are, uh, work in this field, in the design field, know, have known about non ductile concrete buildings or the potential for non-ductile behavior of older concrete buildings. Um, there hasn't really, you know, up until the last few years, frankly, there hasn't been too much uh, done about it. Um, and building officials, it's interesting, are particularly concerned. Why? Well, the code allows a building official <coughs> to go into any building and look at it and say, you know, this is dangerous, I, I'm going to require somebody to look at it or do something about it. But of course, from a political standpoint, that is not very popular, okay? Uh, people own these buildings, uh, uh, you know, of course, concrete buildings, especially big ones, are owned by people who sometimes are very politically powerful. And so it's very difficult to legislate, it's been very difficult to legislate uh, improvements it's not like unreinforced masonry, where these were owned by, uh, uh, you know, individuals or small families and that, and, and they were obviously all bad. I mean, you know, not all, but I mean, they were predominantly bad buildings. The problem with concrete buildings is they're not necessarily non-ductile or dangerous. Um, but the awareness of, of people, uh, and the general public particularly, um, has been low. Uh, it's improved, but but I think when we uh, were thinking about the Concrete Coalition, uh, we began to realize that a lot of the of the need was just for good, reliable information about the buildings and getting it out to people. And at the time, I I was president, which was uh, uh, almost ten years ago. Um, the board that I had was a very good group. And we talked a lot about this. We talked about what can we do. We have credible information. We're, good, we're an organization that's respected. We have a multidiscipline group. Uh, and how can we help to disseminate good information about, about the possibility of non-ductile concrete buildings and the dangers that they, they may pose? So uh, again, I mentioned this is uh, started in 2006. As a matter of fact, uh, I found out by uh, 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 by uh, looking back at the history that we actually announced the formation of the Concrete Coalition at the 2006 uh, uh, conference, uh, the 100th anniversary of the, of the 1906 earthquake uh, in April of that year. So the Concrete Coalition is just shy of uh, 10 years old, which is phenomenal <laughs> to me. I, I can't believe where the time went. Um, so what did we do? Uh, one of the things we did first, and Jack Maley was sort of the ringleader, is, is we uh, had a little survey and we talked to engineers and we said, let's, let's, try to, let's try to come up with the top 10 deficiencies that we would worry about most in concrete buildings. And so that was, that was sort of one of the, the, the very initial uh, project or, or effort that we put together with the Concrete Coalition. And so you say, well, what, what is a Concrete Coalition? What does that mean? Um, what our plan was is to say, look, if we can find some uh, uh, individuals that have an interest in this and formulate some projects or activities that they would find interesting and fulfilling, 
then then we can save money because we're not we're not giving grants to people to do studies or whatever. We're just finding things that people can do, you know, eight hours a month or something like less. And and then the money required is relatively small. And so the, the strategy was to do, to try to get some funding for EERI's administrative support. So in other words, we had this group of engineers that we could leverage with a small amount of money to support the, the management and, in, and, and administration of these individuals. And so the first, the first funding that we got was from the uh, uh, state of California Office of Emergency Services. And we put together a proposal and the idea was we will go to individual communities and uh, find volunteers that either live in that community or work there or have an interest one way or another in that community and try to estimate how many concrete buildings built before 1980 there are in this community. And so we moved forward with that. And then if you go to the website, you can find the results. There is, there is a guideline that we developed for cities who want to uh, document their uh, inventories further. Uh, there's the results of the inventory uh, uh, and uh, quite a bit of information on just being able to count the number of buildings that might be in uh, one jurisdiction or another. And there were many ways that people did this. Uh, uh, I don't know if Dave McCormick's here. Dave, Dave, Dave got on his bicycle in, in Alameda and rode all over town and, 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 and looked for concrete buildings, okay? Uh, other groups, there were some students that uh, got together, and I'll talk a little bit more about Los Angeles and San Francisco later, but we'd have them go out and we'd look at the tax assessor's roles or whatever and, and, and see if we could find uh, uh, where concrete buildings uh, could be located and come up with a rough estimate in some cases uh, for how many buildings there were. And all of that's available uh, for people uh, now. There was a, there was a, a councilman at, uh, in, in Los Angeles. This, hap this was in, uh, in, in March of 2008, Greg Smith, and he was Hal Bernson's successor. I don't know if you remember Hal was a, was a councilman who proposed, I think it was called Division 95, which was, was proposed by him as a, a mandatory ordinance to evaluate and fix concrete buildings in Los Angeles in 1995. Well, it, 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 it became an advisory committee. Uh, and it's interesting, there's an interesting story there. Uh, they were all set to pass Division 95 as, as a uh, mandatory ordinance. And then they had a, a session where engineers came in. And there was, there, were, there was an individual in particular and others that didn't like Division 95 because it didn't use their methodology or whatever. And so they, they made a big deal about this in front of a lot of politicians. And that was the kiss of death because that gave the politicians the out to say, hey, the technical community can't agree on it, so we better not make it mandatory. And I'm happy to say, I think over the last almost 20 years now, that's changed. So I think that there's a pretty good consensus within the engineering community and, and others, uh, professionals interested in earthquake safety, that, that concrete buildings are a problem and that we have good ways uh, to investigate them in detail, but maybe not uh, in, in, we'll talk a little bit more about simple uh, uh, methods to identify uh, the most dangerous buildings. But in any event, there's better agreement today in the uh, technical community. So Greg Smith, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the, he, he wanted to follow in his mentor's footsteps and bring up this mandatory ordinance again. And he, he faced the same thing, the business, building owners and business, not the same thing, but building owners and business community wouldn't even, wouldn't talk to him. And so uh, Mark Bentheim, uh, 
invited me to come down and, and, and uh, he knew about the Concrete Coalition. He said, why don't you come down to this meeting? Greg Smith's gonna be there. And so what we told him, and, and, and he was very good at listening to what we had to say, and we said, you know, we really ought to work on bringing these stakeholders in, explaining the problem to them, and, and get their input on how to, how to, how to solve the problem. And it actually worked out amazingly well. Uh, we got uh, BOMA and the Downtown Alliance and several other community organizations to sit down and listen, and we heard their concerns. Uh, we talked about different strategies, and there really was a pretty good consensus that we did need to do something. It needed to be sensible. It, it needed to be fair. Uh, and uh, there had to be a lot of communications with the stakeholders and continued uh, uh, throughout a period of time. Um, at the same time, and Jack's going to talk more about this, um, the Pure Grand Challenge was going on in Los Angeles. And part of their, uh, it was a pilot city for the Pure Grand Challenge where they wanted to go in and develop an inventory, do some risk studies uh, about what, uh, what kind of uh, dangers are posed by these buildings. And um, so Pure was one of a, a great partner of ours and we decided to collaborate with, uh, uh, the, with the Concrete Coalition volunteers sort of helping out on the inventory uh, of the buildings, and and so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of volunteers went out and helped uh, Mary Camario and Thalia Agnana uh, to to develop and ground truth an inventory of concrete buildings. They started with a with a list that had been uh, called down to from tax assessors' roles down to what likely were actually concrete buildings. I don't know if you've ever looked at tax assessor's roles, but if it's got concrete on the, if it has a concrete sign in front of a steel building, it, chances are it might be called concrete. So it's very, tax assessor roles are very unreliable. And there had been some, some calling uh, uh, of that, but there still was a lot of uh, uh, noise and stuff in that data that we had to get out of it. And we worked uh, arm in arm with uh, Pure uh, Grand Challenge Group. The end of that process was what became uh, famously or infamously known as the LA List. And um, uh, they, the city knew that this list existed and uh, there was uh, some, uh, uh, some concern and uh, you know, whether they really, they didn't, we didn't know whether they really wanted it or not. And Jack was, Jack Maley was in the middle of all of this. But long story short, uh, they they turned the list of these pre, and all it says is these buildings are pre-1980. Doesn't say they're dangerous. It says here are pre-1980, a list of pre-1980 buildings. Um, but even that was was controversial. But that's out, uh, that's, that's, seeing, that's seeing the light of day. Uh, and... Uh, has, has uh, provided them with uh, a lot of good information. Uh, and there actually is an ordinance that uh, is on the books now in Los Angeles. And over a period of time, they're going to be uh, tightening up the controls on concrete buildings. And I think that's a good thing. They didn't go in and just try to make it mandatory. It's stretched out over a period of time. So what else did we find from the peer inventory? And there's, there's lots of data there. Uh, and here's one just based on height, all right? So when we begin to look at these things and trying to find the dangerous buildings, look at, uh, look at how many of them are, are one, two, and three stories, okay? And we know those buildings generally perform pretty well, okay? So as we look forward, you know, maybe there's a way that we can, we'll talk about this stuff, you know, maybe there's a way we can give a, somewhat of a dispensation if we're really looking for killer buildings, buildings that are going to hurt people, is to look first at those that are, are taller uh, and maybe uh, put the smaller buildings on the back burner. 
Uh, just uh, this is building area, which is also available. And then the age, this is pretty interesting because you can see the two spurts of, of growth. You know, one is in the, you know, after the depression sort of, and, and, uh, and these are basically the smaller buildings. Uh, and then in the, you know, late 50s and 60s, this is when the architects figured out that you could do fancy things with, with concrete. And that's probably where, and I'm not blaming architects for this, don't get me wrong, um, but that's probably where we're going to find most of our problems um, with, with buildings that, that, that are dangerous. And functional use, this is just a, another category that uh, uh, is available from the pure data. You can see again, industrial, manufacturing, warehousing, those are small, relatively low-rise buildings, okay? Uh, but if you look at, you know, commercial, well, or residential might be high rise or not, but, but we can look at these uh, data now uh, uh, from, uh, from Pier uh, to begin to make some headway on uh, where to look for the dangerous buildings. Uh, now let's move up north. Uh, uh, this, uh, I see Steve Kataszewski's here, I have to give him uh, you know, credit for uh, working very hard on the SF in, uh, San Francisco inventory. And one thing that, that, that Steve found is that San Francisco used the Sanborn maps uh, up until, what was it, 19, 1980. So, so I don't know if you know what Sanborn maps are. Sanborn was a company that went around and drew these maps, very detailed and, and color-coded, for insurance purposes that would say how tall the building is, what it was made out of, et cetera. And, and, and they would go around every few years and to different communities and update the maps. Now, many people stopped doing that because it probably was expensive, but, but San Francisco continued. And so, as Steve mentioned, they had Sanborn maps all the way up to 1980. And so Steve and, and other volunteers started looking at this material and found that it was really pretty good. And um, as a matter of fact, these are, the, these are the number of concrete structures that were documented in, in, the, uh, in the Sanborn maps. And, and it turns out that there were about 3,800 of them in San Francisco. Um, now we also, I should also mention David Bonowitz was at the same time doing really uh, doing pounding a lot of pavement, trying to look at these buildings and make sure that they really are concrete. We then had a big volunteer effort with a concrete coalition to go out and do some more ground truthing and to, to make sure that, that these uh, records were accurate. And we actually found that they were very good. Uh, and so the inventory in San Francisco is, is quite good. Now, the, the, we get back to the real issue is, okay, now we know, let's say we know the concrete buildings in San Francisco and LA, we know where they are before 1980. Now, how many of them are really dangerous? I mean, really dangerous. And if we look at past earthquakes, this is a, some summary of a, a data that was assembled by uh, Sean Otani back in 1999 about, about how many buildings out of a total where there's very strong ground shaking and all of these events, and you can see that those that actually collapsed uh, were, were quite small, the, the percentage, okay? Now the trick is, is there a way that we can go and look at buildings and without doing a complete non-linear time history analysis or whatever, and say, you know, th these buildings are particularly dangerous, okay? And um, that, has been the trick because it's very hard to tell people, yeah, well, you know, you're, you're, you've got a concrete building, you should spend 50,000 or whatever. Uh, I think that's good, that number's going down now, but, but, but a lot of money investigating a building where you may or may not have a problem. So if I go back and I say the initial conclusions and recommendations with the, with the concrete coalition, kind of through the LA and San LA experience, and, um, uh, and San Francisco back probably uh, oh, uh, 
you know, six, six years ago, six, seven years ago, uh, was that the current simple procedures fail a large majority of these bills. And we all, we know that. I know there are improvements have been made, and we may hear about more uh, this afternoon or later when Wasim talked, but the problem was if we use the checklist or whatever, we kept, you know, virtually all concrete buildings fail. So, and as I mentioned, the detailed investigation of the building are expensive. So let's define dangerous in a qual somewhat qualitative way and say it's a high, high probability of collapse in a relatively small event. And can we develop efficient guidelines to identify the dangerous building? Okay, and this was sort of a culmination or a point at which um, uh, we felt we had looked at the situation fairly carefully, and this is what we came up with. We really need to be able to identify truly dangerous buildings. And uh, uh, there, the agencies were very responsive. Okay, you're gonna hear about ATC 78, which is an analytical procedure that, that Bill has worked hard on, and FEMA funded. Uh, then uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit this afternoon, I'll mention it in a minute, a little further, but more this afternoon on ATC 95, which was uh, funded by NIST. And then the Concrete Coalition actually got some funding from USGS uh, to do a database on the performance of concrete buildings that I'll, I'm gonna tell you about. But it's, I'd also like to mention that FEMA has also been very supportive of the Concrete Coalition generally. And, uh, and it's, it's been great to get the support we need to keep these volunteers going. Okay, uh, kind of the last thing I want to talk about this morning is the sort of the, this is where the, the Concrete Coalition, this is probably the most recent tangible uh, uh, product that the Concrete Coalition has, has put together. And what it is, I apologize for this, you can't really read the slides, and I'm not uh, proposing that you do, but if you go online, there is now a database on the Concrete Coalition site, and it has about 50 or 60 buildings in it. And, and based uh, on, you can search based on location, uh, you can search based on lateral load system, uh, or vertical load system, and there's a case history documented there for buildings that either collapsed or or didn't collapse, were damaged and didn't collapse in past earthquakes. And the point is to get some empirical data about performance of buildings and so that we can calibrate analytical methods and know whether we're really looking at, at the right stuff. And the database has several different uh, forms, all right? You can go there. And first of all, it'll tell you, this is for a, a Turkish apartment building uh, in Istanbul, or Adipazaro, I'm sorry. Uh, and it will tell you about the earthquake, okay? Tell you how strong the, the earthquake was, or whatever information that uh, we had. We had a group of interns uh, at, at, at EERI, about five of them working last summer on this. And the volunteers were professionals that came in and, and answered questions for them and help show them which way to go to find more information on, on these buildings. And they really, uh, they really got on the internet and found an incredible amount of information on these buildings. So besides the earthquake and, and soil conditions, you can get information on what kind of damage occurred, okay? Pictures, uh, reports, uh, you know, summaries, um, and then uh, the other thing we did is we, we in ATC 95, and I'll talk more about this this afternoon, we developed a, a, we looked at 10 buildings, the Concrete Coalition assembled data on 10 buildings that were known to, known to have collapsed in past earthquakes, and they were all uh, buildings from the United States or New Zealand in Christchurch. And, and we develop a compendium, or we, we took all of the checklists, you know, out of Neherp and, and, uh, and, and, and 
I forget the names, what the names are now. I guess it's all uh, uh, ASC 41, but it used to be uh, uh, a, uh, like in a 31, the checklist at that time. And we assembled all of these and, 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 and put them all together. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this afternoon, but we, we, the characteristics in the database, you can see the contribution to damage, okay? And, and we had the, the uh, uh, in the case of the 10 buildings in the United States, the HEC 95 group evaluated whether any of those contributed to the damage, okay? And you have possible, likely, unlikely, or not a, applicable. So anyway, we use this for the whole database. And this is another thing that the, that the uh, volunteer engineers helped the students with was to classify the damage, look at it and say, well, did this contribute to the collapse or the damage that was observed? And then this building in particular didn't, wasn't repaired. We don't know what happened to it. But if the building was repaired, you can find out details about what kind of repair was implemented. And then finally, and probably most importantly, in some sense, if you want to go deeper, there's a list of references. All the references that the, that the students found and was the basis for their uh, case history uh, are, are included in the database. And so that's kind of the latest, uh, the latest uh, product, product of the Concrete Coalition. I encourage you to take a look. It's, uh, it's certainly uh, interesting, and, and I think as we talk this afternoon, it may be a path that we want to continue to pursue. Finally, uh, this picture, I, I, <laughs> I put this in late because it happened last week, but that's Mira Garcetti signing the, the earthquake, uh, uh, toughest, toughest earthquake safety rules in the country. And this is really, really gratifying because this is, this is something that the Concrete Coalition played uh, a role in. And uh, we want, we would like to keep going uh, and, uh, I'd like to thank now all of the people, or most of the people in this room probably, were volunteers at one time or another. And I think we can all be very proud of the accomplishments that we have had 